All right, I think we're about ready to get started. Awesome. So a few words. I just want to say thank you to Novartis for allowing us to come here. They do not allow food or drink in this auditorium other than bottles of water. So if you do have food or drink, I see you. <laughs> Please take it out. <laughs> it's very generous of them to let us use this, and I would like to be invited back. So for those of you who do not know me, I'm Michelle. I am the program chair for the Boston Area Group for Informatics and Modeling. If you're new, welcome. We are super happy to have you. So we are a group of people who are inter interested in all of the problems at the intersection of life science and computer science. And my job within Bagum is to come up with the programming, so the speakers that you see here today. I am extremely interested in your thoughts on who should be a good speaker. If you've come and spoken to me about it last year, I probably forgot. Please come speak to me again. We will have a one-hour panel follow with Q&A, as well as an introduction to today's topic by Lucas. And then after that, we will have food and drink directly upstairs. The food and drink are going to be really awesome. I previewed the menu, so you should stick around for that. I would also like to issue a friendly reminder that it is fundraising season, we really appreciate your funding. It allows us to do things like give you food and wine upstairs. If you're not a sponsor, why not? If you are a sponsor, give us more. You can find Tony. Where's Tony? Tony, that man would be happy to take your money, and I would be happy to watch it. All right. So a few notes about us. These are our current corporate sponsors. They're pretty awesome. You want to be one. Oh, no. Let's just do it this way. We're going to do it old school, because I'm computer literate, I promise. This is how you can sponsor us. It's not that expensive. We would love it if you did. If you are not getting any of our announcements, there's really basically an infinite number of ways that you can be getting our announcements. If you are having problems, please contact Mike. Mike, raise your hand. He is the guy that can make sure that you're getting our announcements. If you have a job and you are interested in advertising it to the Bagum community, that's really awesome. You can do it yourself or you can have us do it for you. You go to our Meetup page and you can find all of the postings there. There are a number of jobs that we know about. There could be more. If you hear about more, let us know. We will advertise it to the community. And these are just a small number of them that I happen to remember. One important guideline, there is no photography or recording without speaker's consent. We are recording this session right now for you. If all of the speakers and panelists agree, we will redistribute it. So please do not take it upon yourself to record anything. And one final announcement is that we have a few upcoming events, including various workshops being organized by CCG. Assam can tell you more about those, Assam Wave. As well as the Schrodinger user group meeting. I know we have a lot of Schrodinger people here, Wave. Oh my god, there's so many. Uh, and then we have another Bagum lecture that I'm really, really excited about because for a really long time I've wanted to get somebody from David E. Shaw Research or DesRes to come all the way up from New York and we got someone and we got David Shaw to sign off on the talk, which I'm super excited about. So we hope that you'll come on October 19th for that. And then one last event, which is the Computational Drug Development for Biologics Seminar. So that's it for the nitty gritty. It is now my pleasure to introduce Lucas Nivon. So Lucas got his PhD at Harvard University with Eugene Chaknovich, where he studied computational biophysics and RNA folding. And then he went on to do a postdoc at the University of Washington with David Baker, where he studied enzyme engineering and protein design. He then founded a startup on the side, which is still running successfully, and he thought, you know, I have too much free time. So he decided to found another startup, which is Cyrus Biotechnology. So he's one of four co-founders, and he is the CEO. And he's here today to talk to us about molecular modeling in the cloud, along with our panel of experts, many of whom have traveled far and wide. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Lucas. Introduction. Can everybody hear me? Am I coming over to the mic here? All right. Uh, I'll turn this off. Uh, yeah. Uh, nice to see everybody here. Uh, I just came over from Seattle yesterday. We we're headquartered in Seattle near uh, David Baker's lab. Is kind of the mothership uh, for all things uh, Rosetta in, in our little world. Uh, 
So let's go ahead. Did we decide to have the panelists come up? Turn or <coughs> Um, and actually, yeah, while we're doing that, I'll just introduce everybody right now. And, uh, and then I'll go ahead and do our introduction on our kind of journey uh, onto the cloud at, at Cyrus and, and in the Rosetta community, uh, which has been, uh, there's been a lot of false starts, actually, <laughs> at this kind of thing. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting story. Uh, and then it'll be interesting to hear from everybody else here uh, about their journeys onto the cloud, because I think it's, it's complicated for everybody. Um, so just to, to, by way of introduction, uh, so Dr. Dr. Assam Metwali is a senior scientist at CCG. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Calgary in 2002, where he studied regulation of sepsis and allergic response. Then he moved to Scripps and focused on reconciling X-ray and EM data and shift to industry, joining Sertara, uh, formerly Tripos, as senior scientific fellow. And more recently, July 2013, brought his uh, chemistry and biology expertise to CCG, where he's now a senior scientist. Uh, Pat Lurton, <coughs> uh, CTO at Schrodinger, uh, SVP and CTO joined Schrodinger in 2006. He was responsible for defining Schrodinger's tech, tech platform, as well as directing all software engineering teams. He joined the company as an engineer and has worked on an array of science projects and provided leadership for both Maestro and live design development. He's received his bachelor's degree in computer science, chemistry, and math from uh, Indiana University, during which he focused his research on high-performance computing and applied molecular dynamics. Uh, and Craig Bruce is a scientific software development manager with uh, OpenEye Scientific, uh, following his PhD from the University of Not Nottingham in chem informatics. Craig moved to AstraZeneca, or AstraZeneca as a scientific computing specialist. He took Design Tracker, used by chemists worldwide, and transplanted it into a highly available cluster, upgrading every hardware and software component along the way. Since then, he moved to OpenEye Scientific, where he works on Orion, a cloud-native platform for computer-aided drug design built using AWS. Uh, Craig interacts with AWS on a nearly daily basis, basis to ensure Orion utilizes the very best in cloud tech. So thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, so by way of introduction, I'll do about a 20-minute introduction about our Cyrus's journey onto the cloud. And then I'll pass over to each of the panelists for a little bit of commentary and then we'll have some Q&A. All right, so just uh, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about why the cloud at all. Uh, what are our goals? Um, and, and our, actually, I mean us as a, as a company, but more broadly, anybody who's engaged in trying to get computers to do stuff in biology, uh, in modeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, and kind of the core of this is our evaluation of different architectures and, and UX, user experience, and UI in the deepest sense of those phrases, uh, and then kind of where we've landed after that exploratory process. Uh, so just very briefly, so we're coming out of this Rosetta design world uh, where there's historically been a huge amount of compute running uh, Rosetta at home on Boink. Uh, of course, Rosetta recently has been responsible for a number of advances in protein design and modeling. A uh, number of years ago now, the first uh, pretty high resolution ab initio structure predictions and more recently for the first full protein designs uh, and protein protein de novo binders. In a sense, uh, Rosetta has been using the cloud for years. Boink is a distributed computing system that runs on people's web browsers. Uh, and then you see this problem often, and, and this is part of why we do what we do, of, of that's really nice, but that's impossible to do without 200,000 CPUs. That's impossible outside of the Baker lab, uh, just over and over again. <coughs> Uh, compounding these issues, Rosetta itself is a fast-moving code base with uh, over 200 developers and kind of a core of about 30 developers, complex workflows, long training times to learn what to do, and just this kind of overarching thing of always requiring a lot of compute. Uh, just to give you a sense, David's lab at UW uses about 15 million CPU core hours per month. It's actually about a year old now, might be four. Uh, so per really active user, it's about 300,000. CPU core hours per month, and that's Boink, that's national labs, that's in-house compute systems. Uh, and of course, 
these are large hardware requirements. And you have spiky usage even inside uh, David's lab. <coughs> uh, and you're piggybacking here off of other organizations, right? Boink already exists as an entity, and then w we in David's lab were able to use that. These other national labs already exist as entities, and we're able to, to piggyback off of that, right? So that's work that somebody else, federal government or, or volunteers, have put in to, to get you to that point. Sorry. So all of these, the, the huge compute and, and the complexity are, are the reasons that we, as a company, uh, really push to go onto the cloud just to make these kinds of things possible. So we think about what our goals are from two different points of view, from, the develop, from, from those of us who are making software and those of us who are using software, and, and some of us are both, uh, but we'd like there to be a lot more of the latter, of the users. Uh, the first thing from the, from the developer side, the kinds of things uh, that, that we wanted to see, uh, we'd like to have a full solution so Rosetta itself, but, but a lot of molecular modeling is part of a software stack. It's not just one thing. It's part of something that you're using with other parts. Uh, and you need to be able to solve everything in, in, in a way that's, that's convenient. You want to be powerful, the real thing. You want to do the real simulations, but, not, uh, but still easy to use. Uh, for, this, this means, for us, this means a graphical user interface. And of course, a lot of molecular modeling tools have a, a, a GUI. Uh, of course, in, in our world, there was Foldit that was easy to use but lacked most of the features of, uh, of Rosetta. Uh, so a real solution needs a lot more compute and kind of professional features than that kind of solution. <coughs> From a developer point of view, you'd like to be as cross-platform as possible. It's difficult to maintain software that's on particular clients. Uh, so from our point of view, code maintenance, uh, these very kind of pro software engineering kind of point of view, Using containers and a thin client are ways that we can maximize stability, upgradability, maintainability of code, which, I mean, that's money in the end. It's just like, how many devs do you need to maintain a code base and keep it moving? Uh, the huge compute problem really is only available in the cloud. Uh, it does require, ideally, auto-scaling tools that, that should minimize scripting, and the more you minimize scripting, the more you're accessible to, to more users who are biologists and not uh, not adept at using computers. And in the end, just as, a, as developers, and, and for us coming from academia, to go from thinking about making an algorithm that works to thinking about focusing, solving user problems. From the user point of view, uh, and again, this is our point of view, users for, for Cyrus, but I think for all of us who are engaged in making software for, for biotech, uh, thinking about the user perspective, We'd like to provide up-to-date science and software, of course, uh, and that's a, that's a value in itself, and the cloud makes it easier to keep things up-to-date. <coughs> Speed comes up over and over again. I think we can all appreciate. I want results tomorrow. I want results yesterday. Uh, you'd like to have as much compute as you can in, in ways that the speed is not just the runtime, but also the setup time can be pretty debilitating. Uh, you want more users. You know, internally at a company, or if you're a seller, if you're selling software like us, either way, you want more people to be using the thing that you make. Uh, ideally, the more people that there are using it, the more value the entities that are using that software derive from it. Uh, and I think um, you know, there's a lot more that computation broadly can do in, in the industry, and, and that one way to measure that is in terms of users. Fast deployment, so. Again, you'd like to see when there are advances in the science, when there are advances in the software, that it comes out fast. You don't have to wait for it. And so this is one of the big advantages of, of the cloud that I think is pretty familiar by now. Low maintenance costs. So again, this comes down to money, right? So, uh, and this is kind of a classic story. I don't think I'm the first one to have said this. And you've actually had a, I think, a cloud speaker who've talked about this before at Bagum. So, uh, from the user point of view, you'd like to not have to do upgrades. You'd like to not have to worry about uh, is your software even, is, is it working on your premises? Uh, and there's a lot of value there and uh, time saved by going onto the cloud. And all of that comes back to, in the end, money, so lower total cost. So if you think about the, the you're not owning hardware, you're not spending money on IT maintenance uh, and upgrade costs. Uh, in the industry now, the average hardware and IT together spend is, is roughly equal to software spend, averaging over the whole uh, biopharma industry. Um, 
So you'd like to think of ways overall to, to, to save money and by, you know, if you think about the total cost to get answers through software, uh, that includes all these ancillary costs and not just the software itself, the cloud is a way, especially for smaller organizations, is a way to save money. So just a little bit, that, that's our motivation of how we came to the cloud and it was very natural. Uh, so now, based on those kind of ideas, what, what does that imply about the architecture that, that we wanted to build? And I think these, again, um, these lessons aren't just for us. I think this is, these are things that apply uh, you know, to internal software groups and to software companies. Um, so our cloud evolution, right? So we started this pre-cloud architecture in academia. Uh, and if you think about this thing, so it's command line, it's multi-tiered, you do small runs locally on your compute. Now, is there a pointer? Oh, okay. So you're, you do small runs locally on your compute nodes. You have lots of users using lots of compute nodes on a shared file system. Uh, when you go to do large runs, you go out into these larger systems, high performance compute with various queuing systems. Uh, you have different levels of computing systems. You have things that are distributed computing like Boink. Uh, each of these has their own scripting. Uh, and then you, have, you, you collect data back off of that and then you have, a, uh, you have to analyze all that data back on your, uh, on your compute nodes. This is what it looked like. Thank you. So this is what our pre-cloud architecture looked like. And then of course, all of this you're interacting with uh, through, a, through a, a local client to do graphics and, and analysis. Uh, so just briefly, coming back to those kinds of ideas from the developer point of view and the user point of view of principles of what we want to do, and, and I won't go too far into this, but uh, we want scalability. We want to do small runs and big runs, right? Like on this thing, the way I do a small run and the way I do a big, a small run lives here, a big run lives here. They're very different. Uh, I want scalability. Uh, I want reuse. Um, so, so I want to use modern tools that are going to be, uh, that are going to extend f further into time. Uh, I want connectivity to other apps. We don't live kind of on our own and all of our apps can connect to each other. Uh, often what that means nowadays is a RESTful API, which can be for internal or for in external integration. Uh, you want, of course, rigorous testing, which this is not <laughs> a surprise, but this has been, in our community, has been kind of an issue uh, in the Rosetta world. Uh, you want system isolation, so for stability. Uh, and in our case, um, and, and maybe this is a little bit unique, but Rosetta itself, because it's an academic tool, has a lot of gotchas and a lot of traps uh, that can catch it. Um, so by doing system isolation of Rosetta into VMs, uh, it, it isolates a lot of error handling, and, and I think that's true for any kind of less stable code. Uh, VMs keep things wrapped up. Uh, fault tolerance is kind of universal value. Uh, in our case, and I think in many cases, is a microservices architecture and a RESTful API, so things can go off and die, and you just forget about them, and you get another result. Uh, and we talked over, I've, I've raised the point a number of times of maintainability. Uh, in our case, this means containers rather than traditional VMs. Uh, they're easy to develop, they're easy to deploy uh, in a realistic setting and, and rapidly. Uh, so we like that in terms of um, system maintainability. So all these things are the kinds of things that we'd like to see uh, in our solution. And we want to make the users happy. Uh, so kind of our first idea is a, is a Rosetta internal scaler. Uh, so I'm basically saying, well, I have the system like I had before and then uh, I have some kind of high, high performance compute, uh, or I have a, basically a cloud system, and then I've modified Rosetta, uh, I've rebuilt it so that it can, it can handle the job scaling itself, imagine, right? And there's been, uh, there's actually been a couple of attempts to do this in the Rosetta world. Uh, and, and of course, they exist, and, and, but they're very difficult, because here you're, if you think about this, this is wrapping in these infrastructure level problems into what's already a pretty, a pretty um, complex code base that is Rosetta. Uh, so this kind of solution would be highly customi customizable, be fast, uh, but it would require that you build a scaler into software, uh, and it would require, in many ways, that you build knowledge of infrastructure into the scaler. And I would characterize some of the earlier efforts uh, before what we did at Cyrus as really being in this kind of growing Rosetta to become basically an infrastructure system. And those were very difficult. 
and didn't get broad adoption. Uh, so now you think a little bit more about, well, how could I go more sort of cloud native rather than sucking up the infrastructure into the Rosetta part? Uh, well, this is kind of what you might think of as a first draft of the cloud uh, would be, well, okay, you have compute nodes, and then you're going to write some third-party controller. So rather than writing the controller into Rosetta, I'm going to make some kind of controller, or I'm going to have some kind of third-party controller either way, and then that's going to handle the compute load uh, onto the cloud. Um, and so this system, this is going to be more customizable because I'm not glomming on a whole new problem onto Rosetta. Uh, again, it's going to be fast. It's going to, depending how good this is at handling spiky usage and turning off workers when I'm not using them, it could be really cost effective for spiky usage. Uh, but now I have this other, <laughs> I basically shifted the problem of making this beautiful cloud controller out of Rosetta into this third party system, which, you know, partly we're not. Uh, infrastructure developers, right? We're scientific developers, that's our core competency. Uh, and there have been some versions of this in the Rosetta world, a number of problems with this. Uh, really, the, the big one is just the still the complexity of the system, that you're not taking advantage of infrastructure systems that already exist. Uh, and, and in particular, a lot of these suffered from problems with lost jobs, because we have very long, long running jobs that can be hard to keep track of and unstable. So we got to kind of to this point. Uh, and then we switched over to, um, not to a deity, but to what would Google do? Uh, what, would a, what would kind of a, an organization that's coming at this, not with our legacy of thinking about how did our old system run, but coming at it from the point of view of well, what a modern tech company that has all the, uh, all the resources uh, and all of the modern kind of concept of cloud, what would they do? Uh, so how does Gmail work, right? How, do, how does any kind of modern web app work? Um, so you have a full, you've gotten, you've, you've totally gotten rid of the, all of this mess of, of, of computers on the front end that you access with a client. Uh, the web browser is the client. Uh, there's, a moder there's a variety of modern JavaScript libraries for this. We use Angular and Node, and I, I think those are uh, pretty standard and uncontroversial. Uh, so all of that front end, what was the computer, the machines here, and, the, and your client are all now wrapped into some kind of front end. You're connecting over an encrypted connection, and of course, in Gmail, HTTPS, 256-bit uh, encrypted. Uh, and then you're handling uh, all of the data, your email in this case, your authentication, who are you, uh, with these backend libraries where you have load balancing so you can get a lot of users. Uh, you're storing data in a database or in cloud storage. Uh, and then you have some kind of system that interacts with this in many kind of, not so not, some, some of the cloud systems just end there, and some cloud systems where you have more compute uh, would have some kind of message passing system that goes out onto auto-scaled workers. So when you have fast things, they can happen here, and when you have slower things, they can go out into these auto-scaled workers. So I'm not saying anything super uh, revolutionary here, but to us, when we started thinking about this coming out of our old kind of architecture, to us, this was revolutionary. Uh, and so that led us to uh, what, it, what is our, our current architecture. Uh, so this is really a classic SaaS style cloud architecture using those kinds of design principles and that kind of general design architecture. Uh, so you know, if before this was, uh, this was a GUI for Gmail, um, here we're gonna use, a, this is, we're gonna make our, a, a GUI that runs, that uses Angular and Node. So again, we're taking tools off the shelf that have been developed for years uh, by very, large entities and, a lot, and it's all uh, open source and uh, stable and, and, and has lots of nice properties and we're just using that, of course it takes time, but we're using that off of the shelf. Uh, so that's kind of your equivalent of your Gmail on the front. Uh, and then all of the back is kind of using combinations of things that have been made before. Uh, so our uh, back end servers, which would be in Node and Python, using different databases. And all these are not, you know, these are like S3 and, and other kinds of storage that already exist. Uh, and then, you know, in that generic one, I said you have some kind of message passer uh, in our case, and in many, many cases, that's RabbitMQ. Uh, and then you have uh, an auto scaling machinery that's handling auto scaled workers on the back end. Uh, and what that requires is just a little bit, so this has a little bit of the flavor of the very first solution. It does require a little bit of modification of Rosetta itself to be able to run in this kind of context. Uh, and it requires API versions of all the different software. So remember, you know, our tool happens to be Rosetta, but these boxes could be anything that 
have something to do with bioinformatics or with modeling. And uh, they just have to be able to talk JSON, basically. So they have to be able to communicate uh, via an API using JSON, RESTful API, so they can make results and pass them back. And now, once you've, once you've satisfied that, everybody can talk to everybody. Everybody can hand data to the servers, to the front end, keep data persistent on databases. Uh, and then if you've done this auto scaling uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, then you can handle very small loads and you can handle up to very large uh, computational loads. Uh, all of that without scripting, right? So all of that just um, from the point of view of a, of a front end user. Uh, the big downside, I would say, uh, to, to this kind of system, and, and I put it in the abstract, We've taken a lot of this user complexity that was in uh, that was in scripts and in Condor queues and 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 all of these kind of things that are kind of in our case often held together just by duct tape. Basically, we've taken a lot of that complexity and, we, and now we've pushed it into the the backend server complexity, uh, and that's a lot of time. So those are things that each of those setups would have been a simple Python script that a, that a scientific dev would make in a day. Uh, and now we have a much more robust system, but it takes a long time to roll all of that complexity into automated systems. So the big, you know, the, the, the fee that you pay for this, in the end you get this really usable, high uptime, very scalable system. Uh, you know, the, the, the difference is that you, you've paid a lot of penalty in terms of dev time to get, to, to roll all these systems into your backend servers. Uh, so I'd say, you know, there's no free lunch. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of advantages here, uh, but that, I would characterize that as the main, the main kind of downside uh, from our point of view. And uh, yeah, with that, I will take questions. <laughs> Or should I go over to, well, are there any, any questions first? Or? Yeah, well, let's do the, why don't you, so we'll go over to full Q&A, but I'd like for each of you to do a, a, a just a couple of minutes introduction, uh, either of your, um, you know, what you view as challenges for molecular modeling going onto the cloud, or just your view of, uh, you know, um, how you've adapted to the cloud. Uh, yeah, Craig, you want to go ahead? Can you hear me? So, so a lot of things that um, we've just seen in that presentation overlap with the things we've been seeing at OpenEye, uh, the challenges of moving your architecture from uh, more traditional compute to a more SaaS-based solution, and that's something that we also believe is a really good, good design. It's something that we've worked on uh, for quite a while, um, and it's very true. There is no three lunch. Um, there's a lot of development effort. So we started off with two developers, myself and one other, uh, five years ago, and now there's 15 plus of us working on one project. Um, it's a serious investment. It will hopefully pay off, you know, but it's a, it's a lot of work. It's not like a, I'll just knock this up on Friday afternoon. Um, and a lot of the libraries uh, that you talk about are very true. They're open source. They're very popular. They're very powerful. Um, they're not necessarily very easy to use or very easy to learn either. It's a, it's a lot of investment um, if your primary task is working on a project, not developing code. Um, similarly, as, as we started off our cloud usage from essentially zero, when I arrived at Open, I had not used any cloud technology before. It's all been traditional on-premise, buy from IBM, that sort of approach. Um, all the pain points that we've gone through <laughs> around how do we understand the billing models, how do we utilize these different resources, you know, it looks like a file store, but it actually isn't a file store. It's all just a little bit different. Um, and learning that has been invaluable to us. And uh, this is the same challenge that you will find as you start to migrate towards the cloud and you try to use te these technologies either directly or through like a third party package. Um, so we're quite keen on building that knowledge in because you don't want to go through some of these pain points um, just the same that you've been through them. It's, uh, that there are, there are, it's a different paradigm of working that's very powerful, but only in to utilize its, its real power, which is being cloud native, you, you, you do have to to go all in on that. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, well, at CCG, we've uh, taken a little bit of a different approach, which is that uh, 
for the most part, we, we weren't really doing cloud beforehand. And I just want to try to dispel this idea that cloud is something new. Cloud has existed for many years. Uh, everybody has a cloud. It's called a, uh, a compute cluster sitting in there uh, in, internally. And really, cloud is just uh, we've migrated those uh, machines, those resources out into the uh, to be somebody else's responsibility, so to speak. So uh, Mo, from really from the beginning, has been designed to be highly scalable and has been able to distribute across those uh, resources uh, very efficiently. Uh, now, in terms of migration of Mo itself into uh, cloud usage, it's actually a fairly simple model where you are able to launch a machine and uh, scale up your clusters uh, in, in a fairly straightforward uh, manner. And you can use those resources just as you would sitting at your own desktop. And that simple I guess more simple approach is uh, something that's been appealing to us. Uh, at the same time, we also have other offerings such as uh, Silo and uh, um, Mosaic, which uh, can actually leverage those resources a little bit more in a distributed fashion uh, where you look at this thin client side. So really there's an offering for, uh, for everybody in that regard. Um, anyways, I think with that, that's... Hello? myself up here. Um, I'm <coughs> glad to be sitting last because I get to agree with both of them every time, I think. Um, we have part of our platform that is live design and is built to work, it was built from day one to work very well in the cloud. It's actually internally deployable as well uh, because what he said is absolutely true. A cluster is a cloud that you keep in your own basement. Um, but on top of that, we also have Maestro, which is more traditional. You can have clusters that you spin up on demand and launch to them and it goes back to how people have been doing these computations for 20 years. Uh, and that's kind of slides one and three for the different methods, I guess you were talking about. And slides two, we also have, I think, two more methods of launching. So we have like the full spectrum of uh, ways to abuse the cloud. Um, I think one thing that uh, as a computer scientist, we much like, uh, you know, people can sometimes oversell modeling. We constantly oversell the libraries uh, that are put together. Um, the JavaScript stuff, the, the two he mentioned have been hot for like two or three years now. And before that, there were ones that were hot for two or three years. So that's actually one of the most painful parts about building out a cloud platform that we found is you're just constantly moving on to new technologies. Uh, we find ourselves actually supporting a library that Facebook put together five years ago because Facebook got over it and we're totally dependent on it. Mm. Um, so these things do happen. Uh, but that said, we get a lot more than we have to give. It's really good to, to take in the open source. Um, but the, we're basically trying to be as pragmatic as possible. We want to be able to enable people to push their projects forward as much as they can in any way they can, no matter how they want to run their calculations. Their companies and, and the majority of our customers at this point are still terrified of the cloud in terms of security reasons. Um, the users want it more than anything because they want to get away from their IT. But the security people are, are truly terrified of the cloud for most customers. Uh, and then we have the flip side of it. Um, when I'm out talking to live design people, I love talking to my small biotechs because they want to be on the cloud as quickly as possible. They want to be able to scale up to 20,000 cores without having to buy a giant cluster. And we love approaching that side of it. So it's fun being a Schrodinger, it's seeing you know, the full spectrum of conservatism where the cloud's concerned. But just kind of rambled. But it's Okay, so uh, I can. Oh yeah, the, the question the, is. Oh yeah, you go I'll, yeah. Uh, so the question is, can we talk about checkpointing uh, when a node dies from underneath you whilst running, and um, both specifically with respect to spot instances? And sorry, I'm just going to repeat the questions so that we get them on the tape. <laughs> so uh, just for those who don't uh, know, spot instances are a specific instance in the case of Amazon where you can actually bid on time in the cloud, where essentially you have a free market, uh, you place a bid for how much you're willing to pay for that particular type of machine, and uh, as long as the market price is below that price, uh, you can get uh, a fairly cheap uh, compute resource. But as soon as the market price exceeds your bid, then your machine gets unceremoniously dumped. So, 
checkpointing. <laughs> uh, this, this fault tolerance is absolutely critical. Um, and as far as the way that we've approached it, I've always, uh, I prefer to use spot instances because they're so cheap. Um, they can basically run you less than an eighth of the price of a normal instance. Uh, but you're getting the same uh, uh, computation. So you have a choice. You can either uh, just try to uh, pursue it very aggressively and really short chunks and grab your data as you go, or you can do a checkpoint strategy wherein I personally have been using uh, uh, EBS-backed uh, storage. So this uh, these uh, elastic block storage, uh, it's not... Um, it's not sensitive to being torn down, so it persists regardless of whether the machine that it's attached to has been uh, removed. So as a result, uh, all of the data automatically gets checkpoint. In addition to that, the software itself, the way that I construct each of the uh, Mo instances and nodes, uh, sorry, applications, uh, I typically will throw in uh, checkpointing. So there only there's only one node ever really writing uh, at any one point, and that's the master node. Every worker sends its data back, the master will write it to disk, and so you're only ever going to lose what's being computed uh, literally at that instance. Uh, so that's the way we've approached it, and I think it's been very, very successful. I've never lost more than a couple of minutes of work. Oh, yeah. How do we audit the security as we're building our code? Is that a fair short snippet? There's a lot more details that I can, I'll, I'll go through. But um, all of the above, really. We have to have external auditors uh, for the customers that we install live designs. That's the one where it's the biggest deal because we have all of their data. Um, for the ones that we install that in-house, they actually usually have internal security measures that they run our system through. So we'll do a new deploy and we'll get from the various customers that have these policies, we'll get reports, security reports back done for free to make sure that we're not putting something insecure on their system. Um, but on a on a day to day, uh, what we generally do is we have policies for our developers and we have code review and then we um, run uh, automated tests and pay people to do injection testing and things like that against us. I'm not sure. In all honesty, I'd have to talk to the security guy on the team. Does anyone have? In our case, uh, actually, we're because we're taking this uh, uh, more basic approach where you want to migrate your uh, items up to the cloud. We're really depending uh, on the fact that the default the default settings for Amazon, for example, or for Google, for that matter, are actually very, very secure. Unless you've gone in and uh, really modified their protocols and modified the default settings uh, away from uh, um, the secure, basically the secure state, then you're, you're actually in a really good spot to begin with. Uh, additionally, when I mentioned Mosaic and Silo, in general, those actually tend to be deployed on uh, your local clouds. So again, security protocols would be uh, consistent with whatever is in place for the uh, organization. Uh, add to that, uh, so in terms of our actual machines that are running underneath, or we run Linux for our purposes, uh, we store everything, all infrastructure is stored as code. So at all times you can see exactly what was done to the machine, which is very useful from an auditing perspective. I can tell you exactly what version of a package is installed, what version of the kernel, and it's always reproducible. It's always going to be that version. So that tied in with some other checks to make sure when you actually boot the machine, it is that version. You can keep your compliance to a good state. Yeah, I think the only other thing I would add, uh, actually, that's interesting. <laughs> we do exactly that, or, uh, and we've started to do that more than infrastructure. That infrastructure is code. So that everything's rebootable, uh, and and then from our, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, we use external contractors that are penetration testers that'll, you know, white hat uh, hackers to, um, to test everything that we've done because that's kind of the, uh, you know, in the, in the end we can only be by by being compliant with our own standards. I mean we can only do so much, and that's helpful. Yeah, I mean one thing I would say probably the hardest sell for people who are trying to move to the cloud when they have their the big internal security teams and IT teams and all these things 
is just the notion that the data leaves their premise. And there's a lot of fear around that period, no matter how securely you connect them. So I mean, obviously everything is going to be very highly encrypted. It's literally double encrypted on the disk because we have our own encryption keys and Amazon encrypts on the hardware. And we have white papers after white paper, but the second something leaves the premise, it is inherently less secure. So you have to, you have to fight that. So what are the practical considerations and concerns that big organizations face moving from traditional on-premises compute to the cloud? Yeah. So in my experience, uh, that is really, I mean, back to security, is, that's going to be the biggest concern. It becomes a people issue uh, and a policy issue uh, more than anything else. Um, Technically speaking, as I said at the outset, uh, the cloud is really no different than your on-premise resources. So the same, the same protocols that have to be put into place in terms of your IT group for internal usage and how data is shared and how data is monitored and uh, uh, handled, it, ha it applies just as equally, uh, even more so towards the cloud. Um, this entire process has always been a security issue in terms of the encryption. and. Uh, everything, as, as was mentioned, is encrypted on disk, encrypted in the cloud, encrypted in transit. Uh, at the end of the day, the biggest issue is going to be the people who are involved and whether or not they're using secured passwords or whether or not they're talking to the right people. And uh, um, that's always going to be the, the, uh, the Achilles heel, not, not any of the actual technology in place. Yeah, one thing I would add when you're moving a big corporation is that the, the hardest part for the security people is they have to let go. Um, because if it's actual software as a service, if it's not just you're providing them a cloud they can run on, then the security people have to say, okay, this is the end of my jurisdiction. I've, I've said it's safe to hear. You've told me you're going to be safe after this point. And then they have to trust you, and you have to do that through white papers and audits and all of these things. Um, and those are all very time-consuming and moderately expensive. But those are the practical things that, that usually take a lot of time. Um, that said, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to talk too poorly about internal IT teams. They're usually very excited to do this. They're always very overloaded. Anything they don't have to handle themselves, um, they're usually not clingy about things like that. They just want to make sure that it, it's like the the lawyers. They never get fired for saying no. Uh, security people never get fired for saying no. But if they let their data slip, then that's it. So, just just one comment on that that we've been like a positive that we've been surprised by with big organizations, and this is a little bit of our problem of coming from Rosetta, but a lot of IT people don't like Rosetta because it's very unstable and it's like constantly hurting their systems. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there's a value prop of like, oh, the, this really unstable thing, you can get rid of it. <laughs> uh, and, and so to the extent that that's true, there's, there's like this hidden, there's this hidden thing of like getting rid of a headache. So uh, part of that is though uh, that there is, uh, focus at, at this point in saying software as a service or uh, that you're migrating these things out to the cloud. It is also possible for the IT teams to actually curate and maintain and handle those external clusters themselves and in which case they treat it just as they would any uh, internal resource and in fact that uh, tends to be one of the easiest ways to uh, get buy-in and uh, move things uh, forward. Oh, did you? Just a quick comment on that. Um, that I don't think big corporations are going to go all in cloud, at least on Netflix. So there's always going to be this hybrid model of have cloud resources, have on-premise resources. Um, one of the fears of migrating is that all these jobs are going to disappear. I, d I don't think that's true either. All these cloud resources, if it's not SaaS, they still need a lot of TLC. Um, you'll probably be looking after more computers per person, <laughs> virtually, but you'll still need someone in your company being an expert doing it. So it's just shifting around the skill set. Thank you. 
So the question was with regards to, uh, is my calculation worth it? <laughs> how, do you, how do you handle cost and uh, manage yourself on the uh, cloud? Um, so uh, again, uh, this is something that's going, it's as true regardless of whether or not you're, not, whether or not you're in the cloud. So there, there's always a sunk cost to any of these calculations. It's just that now these, that cost is more evident to you. So you either pay for it up front or you pay for it later. Um, so the same, the same calculus really should apply. How do you know whether or not your calculation is worth taking down the entire cluster for a week? Uh, how do you know that uh, that calculation, just because it's in the cloud, doesn't mean that it costs you any less. It just means that other people are now waiting for you. So it's, it's a difficult proposition to, to answer. Now, in terms of uh, can I estimate how long my calculation is going to take? Absolutely. Uh, my recommendation is always start small. Uh, use one of these uh, cheap instances to get a to get a rough estimate on uh, how long the calculation is going to take uh, and uh, whether or not it's worthwhile uh, and whether or not you can distribute it. Again, there's a myriad of methods, uh, including spot instances. Uh, um, Google Compute has uh, interruptible instances, and there's other ways to help control that cost as long as you're willing to uh, take that extra step to uh, um, to use those methodologies. Um, but I, I think it's actually, I think it's a good thing to know what your calculations are going to cost uh, and to actually start to put some effort and thought into, into a calculation rather than running an MD simulation which may not uh, be worthwhile to begin with. Um, we have a few different models to handle the problem. Uh, one of the ones that I think is most popular is to budget just like you would the amortized cost of a cluster and say, you're going to, we're going to bill you $100,000 for CPU this year at the end of the year, and anything under that, we're going to refund you. And if you hit $100,000 early, then we're going to um, let you know and scale you down to some minimum number that you pre-agreed to pay for. And then you can, you can up it more if you want. And on top of that, we'll also put a total cap of the amount of CPUs that are just generally accessible, like a normal cloud. But then if you want to scale up, you can say, OK, you know, I want 20,000 CPUs for this hour instead of my normal 1,000. Two hundred thousand, whatever, we're in the cloud, um, and they would then be able to control their prices that way. So, really, you can set it up so that it, it's compatible with normal uh, large corporation billing, but at the same time can give them burst on demand. Um, I I, uh, I partially agree with you. I would say I do think that it's great to make people think about their calculations more, but I also think it's um, one of the wonderful things about being in silico is people can take more risks, and um, and it can be making them think too much about it can steer them away from interesting questions. This is one of the uh, key points we found early on uh, as well. The, uh, this large bill has come through. Who's, who spent it? You know, was it development? Was it an FSI? Again, that, that um, granularity of the bill is, is also tricky. Um, it's something we've had to build into our application natively to even be able to break apart you know, who spent what. Um, and because this is no longer a fixed cluster, you, know, you could have 10,000 machines running, which However, even on spot is uh, not a small amount of money. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe um, you do need a calculation by tomorrow and you do want to spend a lot of money because the CEO has come down and they really want to see it by 9 a.m. So the question isn't how many cores, it's like when do you need it by? And let the system work out the difference and let it scale up, let it take care of it for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but obviously keeping an estimate of the cost is, is really useful. One of the things we've uh, started to explore is as we have a, a very programmatic sense to running our calculations, is having the authors um, give us information about the sort of expected use time so we can try and look at the, the past runs of this code to work out what a reasonable estimate might be. Obviously, these things are estimates. Um, but to give you a better idea for this sort of calculation takes this sort of time, because um, it's really hard to be exactly on, on the bill. Yeah, I'll just say, well, I, I think this is actually a really interesting question that's not fully <laughs> solved, and this is going to be something that's evolving. And, and um, from our, and I don't think the final answer is here yet, <laughs> a fully final answer. Uh, we do a, a pretty extreme version of that kind of benchmarking uh, that we only ship things that we have time estimates for. Uh, the software is fairly, so, so that means we, um, to ship a product that it has to have 
time estimates so that you get time estimates up front. Um, I guess in, in some way, because we're doing Monte Carlo, maybe there's something it's easier to do maybe in some ways with Monte Carlo, uh, but that's the approach that we've taken to, to, to give predictability and, and answerability <laughs> before you run something. Yeah, I, I mean, just to clarify, uh, in our case, uh, we're really not restricting any sort of calculation. So uh, since we're looking at really ultimate flexibility in terms of the software itself, you, you really can calculate whatever you need and so, or whatever you want. So whatever you want to spend in terms of time is, is what this can come down to. We don't charge anything extra in terms of uh, the software itself. If you're going to scale it on your cloud, you're running it on the cloud with your existing licenses. So it comes down to how much is that cloud comp compute going to cost. And those tend to be fairly easy to answer up front. Uh, I can usually have an estimate within, within a few dollars uh, just, just from looking at our calculation and getting a run after about two or three minutes. Up in the back. We have about five minutes left. <laughs> so the question is uh, long-term maintainability and deployability of code that might be very old uh, and that containers par provide a partial answer to that technically, but then on the license side, uh, how do we solve that on the license side? And should we, should we <laughs> forget about those old tools essentially? Is that... Uh, if we all get together and say, this is, like, kill this. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, I, I completely feel your pain. Maestro turned 20 years last year, and I wanted to get, like, a screenshot from each year for a presentation. And I sent about 15 emails to our licensing team and still was never able to get licenses that worked with the 20-year-old version of it. Uh, <laughs> because we don't have any that are still, we don't generate them forever. And we don't have even the version of Plex LM that would generate it for that old of software. So uh, if you're trying to <laughs> run Glide from 20 years ago, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> personally, uh, I, I don't, we, we don't have to deal with some of the regulatory stuff that pharmas do. And I don't know how much of virtual experiments enter that territory. Is that a concern at all? Or do you think, is it just a scientific just exercise? Um, get over it is, I, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything useful from being able to say, oh, I made this decision 10 years ago because Glide used to have a worse score with the worse force field. Sorry for name dropping my product again. Mo used to have a worse score with your worse force field. Um, no, it didn't. No. Um, I, I don't think there's anything useful at that point. 